Okay, welcome everybody to another acoustic guitar talk live stream. If you don't know me, my name is Simon Candy from Acoustic Guitar Lessons Online.net. And we are today going to be talking about the very important but often overlooked topic of rhythm guitar. We're going to put a bit of a spotlight on rhythm guitar playing, um, which is just happens to be the thing that you do most of the time when playing guitar, even if you consider yourself to be a lead guitar player. So it's a very important aspect of guitar playing to look at, and that's going to be our focus today. And we are streaming, hopefully, <laughs> on YouTube and Facebook. I think that is all working. So perhaps you're viewing on YouTube or Facebook or perhaps on the website. So it's great to see you, whether it's morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Um, so today I have a very special guest with me to discuss this topic of rhythm guitar playing. And uh, he runs his own successful guitar school out of Nova Scotia, Canada. I never know if I pronounce that right. I think that's correct. And has helped many people. Yes, it is. <laughs> I get the thumbs up from backstage. Um, so that is great. Uh, it's helped many people get started playing guitar, often from scratch. Um, and he also runs the guitar website, Guitar Lessons for Beginners Online.net. And I speak of no other than my good friend Mo. So, welcome, Mo. How are you doing? I am great. Great to be here, too. Excellent. And it would be evening for you, early evening, I think. It's what we would call dinner time here, 5 p.m. So 5 p.m. Demo, that's an early dinner. Um, <laughs> uh, excellent. Well, that's good. Well, it's 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 a um, yeah, it's it's a reasonable hour for me. I have got up to do these things at four o'clock in the morning before. It's eight o'clock, so eight's not too bad. <laughs> yeah, fours fours at that time where you're like, do I go to bed or do I? You know, it's just bang in the middle. So sometimes. It's been uh, like that, but this is all right. Eight o'clock gets me up and, and going for the weekend. But anyway, we're, we're here to talk about um, rhythm guitar playing. And as I said in the introduction, it is often something that is um, overlooked um, or, or underdeveloped, basically. Um, we can see that a lot of people, in my experience, and this is, my own also experience teaching a lot of people and playing with a lot of people over the years. You know, you can be, let's say you, you, you're jamming with someone and you're improvising or, or whatever, and someone's taking a solo and you're playing rhythm guitar and, or, or perhaps you're soloing the other person's playing rhythm or back and forth. And you notice that people can solo really well, but their rhythm guitar skills are kind of at a really basic level. Um, and, uh, it doesn't do much for the person playing the rhythm guitar. It's quite boring to be sitting there playing on a pretty basic level. Um, and it's also not great for the person improvising to sort of work off of. Um, so, you know, it's it's often a sign of having put all the eggs in one basket, so to speak, with working on lead guitar and soloing and kind of doing the basics with the rhythm, but, you know, not much beyond that. But perhaps before we even look at some things that you can do to extend on your rhythm guitar playing. It's often also, as I'm sure you've experienced, a uh, um, very, uh, well, important part of playing, but, you know, people can have a lot of problems with rhythm guitar and all the things entailed with that, chord changes and strumming and so forth. In your experience, do you find that? What, do you, what have you found with teaching students rhythm guitar, you know, say from, from the start, what, what are some of the areas that are important to cover in your opinion? Um, so good, uh, good intro. Um, first of all, I want to say that, uh, uh, you're, you're like, I like how you, uh, how you, um, uh, kind of, uh, presented that problem because it does happen and it, it's, it's actually happens quite often uh, people, um, in rhythm are for some reason are not very, very well de developed when they, they play guitar. Um, and the interesting is to me, rhythm is probably the, the foundation, the most important thing of all music. So um, it, it tends to be ignored, which is uh, unfortunate. And so what I, uh, so when we talk about total beginners, let, let's go right down to total beginners, all right? Uh, because th this still applies to other people, but for total beginners, there's some very important things that, that um, I 
I do or teach uh, to help develop uh, and that they need to do in order to be able to not just play simple rhythms, but more complex ones. So um, the first thing and absolutely the most important thing is the, being able to create a constant flow. Um, so strumming is basically your hand moving down and up in succession. And um, a lot of people, um, they, they have really choppy strumming because they, they stop, you know, when they're doing a downstroke or an upstroke or whatever. Um, and it, it, it tends to have no flow and it doesn't really sound like music. So um, one way to look at it is, you know, when you're riding a bike, you know, a bicycle, um, let's say that, uh, you know, you don't have a, you know, fancy bicycle with gears. It's, it's, you know, if, if you don't stop pedaling, the bicycle is going to stop and it's going to fall over. So strumming kind of works like that. Um, if you, if you keep your hands moving, um, it keeps everything in sync and flowing. So that's the first thing is constant flow. All right. Now, um, if, if you want to discuss that, we can, uh, there's a few more I want to add if you want. Um, Sure. That's well, I think, you. yeah, look, I think that, that's a great point. Often it's coordinating the, the fretting and strumming hands. And, um, you know, you might work on your chord changes, you work on strumming patterns, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the both are just going to magically synchronize together and everything's going to be great. You've got to be able to keep things, you know, going, like you say, riding a bike. And, and uh, often the, the issue is, um, you know, strumming out a chord, stopping, making the chord change, strumming again, stopping and, right. and developing that habit of stopping every time you want to make a chord change. And I think in a lot, I mean, guitar playing in general, but if we're talking strumming and some of the other things we'll cover today, um, I think you, you, you've really got to be able to make your, and we'll talk about chord changes, but you've got to make chord changes without having to look at your fretting hand. And you've got to be able to strum and pick without looking at your picking hand because otherwise you're going to be sort of a slave to that. You're going to be, you know, watching tennis, basically. You're going to be here, then you're going to be there, yeah. and you're going to be yeah. here, and you're going to... Yeah. And, and then looking at, at the page or whatever you're looking at in front yeah, of you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's stop, start, and that's what you reinforce. So exactly. you do need to force the strumming with the the hand or force the hand to move with the strumming so you know once you've got some strumming or a strumming pattern going and you've got a chord change then you really want to keep that strumming going with the chord change regardless of how good or bad this is it doesn't matter if this is a bit you know incomplete or you, you you're strumming on a c and you're getting to a g and as you strum right. g you might only have you know these fingers down this one's getting down right. this strumming but that's all fine our goal in that context is to get the two hands working together it doesn't matter if they're not perfect or you know Bingo. just get them in sync and then you know you can continue working on you know isolating the fretting hand if you need to to get those chord changes better and um you know work on the strumming and the sound and so forth things we'll, we'll get into a little bit more deeply but yeah absolutely that's really important um early on when playing and developing yeah you know, the basic skills of strumming and, and chord changes yeah perfect Exactly. And that's exactly it. And um, that means you have to ignore the sound and people have a hard time doing that. And yeah, our ears are really well developed because we listen to music all the time. Uh, but when you're learning to play guitar and, and learning how to strum, it's really important to just ignore that sound. If you make mistakes, just keep going, keep going, keep going. So, um, you know, I'm going to uh, here, here's here's something that just uh, while you were talking, just uh, yep. I thought about and it's a stark difference between two types of guitar players and it, it's because of the way they approach rhythm and um and and so th there's two types of, of guitar players that i teach they're the two types of people uh sure. in general the first type of person is the person that comes in and the, everything has to be perfect hmm. um and you know so that's why they stop they look they check they hover they they do all these things we'll talk more about some of those things how that affects those kinds of people later on those people have a hard time i was one of them okay it, it, it was not easy for me it was because i approached it totally incorrectly meanwhile i get other students and they don't care they just like i'm playing guitar and they're just they're letting everything flow and because of that they make way more progress in way less time because the foundation which is rhythm is laid 
nice and consistent and flows well. Then the chord changes and then all the other things that create a really nice consistent sound, that all comes after. Um, we obviously pay attention to those too, but the, the more important piece is what you just told everybody is to try to keep this strumming going and just don't worry about the other hand for now. And we, we, we can separate the two and, and, and deal with all that, uh, but that's the most important piece. Another important piece is uh, the smoothness. Uh, of strumming. A lot of people when they're strumming, what they do is they, they strum really loud on the downstroke and then, you know, they, they, the, the upstroke is, is not as loud. It, so it's very in, inconsistent. Um, and that leads that it leads to like not sounding that good. I mean, it, it doesn't sound full. It doesn't sound proper, uh, but it also creates a bad habit, which is really hard to get rid of. So it, it's really important to be able to early on, uh, isolate the strumming. So that's what I do with my students is I get them to ignore the, the chord hand and just get them to learn how to listen for and get the feel for strumming smoothly. All right. And that's a way that you can kind of develop that, that ability that later on will help when the chord hand is there. And uh, that, that's one approach that I use and one thing that I, I focus on early on too. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's, that's great. I think it's, um, can be a little overlooked working on ways to get two hands talking. Um, but what about uh, individual? I mean, we do need to isolate, of course, too, picking and fretting hands, whatever we're doing on guitar. But if we're talking about strumming chords, um, let's talk about the, the fretting hand first. So chord changes. So, you know, the, the general sort of wisdom is, you know, just keep practicing, just keep repeating the chord changes and they'll get better magically. <laughs> and of course, you know, that, I mean, that might work for the odd person, but really it's not going to work for, for most people. It's going to just sort of reinforce that frustration as you continue to do that and things don't seem to get all that much better. So there are ways to work with chord changes aside from just, you know, trying to bang yeah. it against the wall and, and just repeat them over and over. So what are, what is in your experience teaching, how do you approach the, the issue of change? Let's say, you know, chords in general, but open chords. Yeah. So, I mean, and uh, boys, is that ever, ever true? Um, <laughs> you know, how often do you uh, hear someone like, you know, if you're on a website or on a, on a Facebook page or whatever, or even on my, on my page, a lot of times people just, just keep, keep doing like, keep working harder, work harder, work harder, you know, practice more. And it's like, um, you know, practicing properly is a secret, not practicing more of the same thing. So if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to get better at the, the same thing. And if what you're doing is wrong, if, if it's right, if it's not the correct thing, uh, you're right. And there's a few people who overcome it. They're the ones that spend hours and hours and hours and hours every day and usually, you know, overcome it because they just use brute force and, and time. Um, but the most of us do not have that kind of time to just play guitar all day and overcome all these bad habits. So um, in order to learn proper chord changes, um, and we talked, like, well, I'll, I'll tie this in with, with doing it with your strumming hand, but I, sure. I really, for total beginners especially, I get them to just isolate again. Um, because if, if you don't program this piece into your brain, if you don't have that pathway developed, um, if you're trying to strum, you're going to be too busy doing that other thing, right? So you first start with just taking this hand and then whatever the chord is, you just, there's two ways. There's the, the very uh, disciplined way where you just put your chord hand down on the chord that you're looking at um, and you know, make sure it's proper. And then you visualize going to the next chord in your head. You visualize where all your fingers need to go. A perfect chord change. You try to visualize that. Then once you visualize it, you slowly try to recreate what you saw in your head and you make the chord change. Cool. You lift, move and land all in one move. You do it very slowly so that the chances. So what happens is your brain corrects on the path there. The first few will be difficult because you've never done it before. So the pathways are being created. So it'll be kind of erratic. But after you've done it several times, and if, you've, if you're disciplined, you will learn and create that pathway very quickly. And then you'll be able to use that chord, that chord change, uh, almost, uh, you know, probably even that same day, depending on how difficult the chord change is, of course. Sure. Um, so, I mean, that's the, the, that's 
but now here's the problem. <laughs> Most people don't have the patience for that. All right. And, you know, it's understandable. They don't want to be professional musicians. They just want to play and have fun. Um, so there's kind of a hybrid version that I, I've developed over time because I realized this, this, <laughs> this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and um, basically what you do is, uh, and these people, they have to strum, they have to sound it off and that's fine. You know? Um, so I work with that. I work with, with, with who they are. And what I do then is I just simplify it to the point where all I want them to do. And if you're listening to this, if you, if you struggle with chord changes, this, this will work really well. So if you're doing a really simple strum pattern, just, you know, even if it's just downstrokes, um, what you do is that one tiny uh, thing that I, I mentioned above. When you go to the chord, you commit to it. You lift, you move, and you go down. Those are three different things that I said, but they should be one consistent committed move. So it should be up, over, down. There should be no stopping, no hovering, no fidgeting, no nothing, no fixing it after you land. Um, and if, if people can do that, it takes a little more time than the other version, even though it feels like they're making progress, but it will actually render pretty good results uh, with chord changes. It, and it doesn't matter how complicated they are. That works pretty well. It, 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 but I mean, again, um, you have to have a little bit of discipline to be able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. I like the visualization thing. I think that's really, really good. Um, it, it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you, in, in my experience, if you're sitting there making chord changes, or you know, people starting on chord changes, and this is what your thing is negating, is the the whole you know one finger at a time, and yeah. of course that's never going to you know. If we keep repeating that, we're we're only I'm trying to get in view here. Um, we're only going to reinforce that. So you're going to get good at making chord changes with one finger at a time, or maybe two fingers. Then one comes on. A, a classic one is like a G to a C, for example. We've got a G chord. Yep. This finger is always going to go down first, <laughs> and then these ones will come on. Right? That's you see that all the time. And perhaps the G, these go on, and then this one goes on, or whatever it might be. So, I think um, you know, focusing on uh, individual fingers. Um, so kind of isolating them within the overall movement or change between two chords. So, for example, if I'm making a, a G to a C chord change and I'm finding I've got that issue of the first finger going on and then the second and third come on, then I would get the student to make a G to C change and you'd take it slower, you would need to, but get that third finger on first. Don't worry about these two for, for the moment. Just flip it around. If it's the first... If, whichever the last finger is on make it the first finger on so if the third finger is last on then make it first don't worry about these being afterward at this point just flip that around so that's already get pretty efficient if you're doing this that first finger is pretty efficient getting from g to c so let's focus on the third finger being efficient from where it is in g to where it needs to go in c we don't want it to go in this sort of uh you know detour over here while you get that sorted and then back down there because if you track that finger it's, you know it's got a lot of movement in it to get from where it is in g to c so we can tidy that up and then you might find that starts to get the fingers all moving together but you could also then focus on the second finger getting to its note in the c chord very efficiently and then add the other two and then if the first needs work or whatever then fine but you you're still making the chord change, but you're isolating the focus on each finger and improving the efficiency of that finger moving from the chord you're on to the chord that you're changing to. And I mean, I do this thing myself. This is the thing. I mean, we're talking about open chords here, um, but it's, it's just because let's say you master your open chords, it doesn't mean your hand's super efficient and any chord you come across now is gonna be fine. I mean, I might play Correct. some jazz stuff uh, or an, an arranged piece or arrange something myself and then I've got to learn it and there might be some chord changes in now I mean I can think of some things now some chord changes I was just doing this the other day and um, you know I had to really isolate a chord change to get my fingers to arrive at that chord at the same time so I'm using exactly the same ideas that you're spoken about I'm talking about here now um, because it's it's a strategy that works for chord changes, period. So it doesn't matter how simple the chord change might be or how difficult it might be, this is something that will work, you know, all round. 
Can I add something? Yes, I found one, there's one more thing that you may want to investigate. You may sure. want to try. Yep. You didn't mention it. And it's something that um, I have used with great success, surprisingly mm -hmm. great success. And um, one thing I've noticed is, um, and, you know, maybe because I did, I did some sciences and stuff when I was, when I was in, in school, when I was a lot younger. Um, and I, and I knew that the physiology of your hand is kind of messed up when it comes to this finger. Yeah, uh, and, and this side of your hand. So um, I just had this intuition to uh, uh, get students that struggle with with moving those things. So this is one more thing I do with people that can't do those two things I've already said or the things that you've mentioned. Actually, sometimes I don't even go to what you're talking about. I go directly to this because I find it works for most people a lot better. And what it is, is learn to focus on two fingers. These two fingers are very strong. And you know what? You can move them together pretty well. So if you, if you, uh, why don't you bring your guitar back up? I don't have mine here. So um, try this. Just, just show this to, to other people, um, Simon. Okay. So do a G chord. All right. And then what I want you to do is only move those two fingers to a C chord. Like and it. what happens is most people can take those two fingers and move them together. And then you can go from a C to a D. You can go from D to a C. And oh, yeah. people can do that and actually coordinate those two fingers very, very well. And if you can get those two fingers down, the third finger is easy. Okay. That's uh, cool. I mean, yeah. right? Um, and uh, so <laughs> what that does is it actually, for me, it simplified the whole process of getting them to the end when they couldn't, it was hard to get the other ones to work or, it, you know, I mean, some people just, it, it doesn't work for everybody because everybody's an individual, but that, that was really successful. Uh, in my case. So something to think about. Yeah, that's really cool. I haven't, I haven't come across that before. Yeah. So just again, isolates those fingers to get them sorted before the good old third finger ring finger. That's true. It's, it's, you know, and the pinky, of course, we all know, know about the pinky. <laughs> mind we won't speak of the pinky. <laughs> <laughs> Flying off everywhere. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, it's, it's also great just to spend time on a chord shape it, just a single chord shape. Let's, I mean, E minor is really simple to to, to begin yeah. with, but to just develop the ability to form the chord mm -hmm. and then lift the fingers away and snap down onto that chord where fingers are hitting the fretboard at the same time. So whether you're on a, an E minor or a G or a B7, something where you've got all four fingers, you're just feeling one point of contact with fingers to fretboard there, you know. So you can start very small by just simply pushing into the fretboard with the chord shape putting a lot of pressure on the fingers more than what you would normally when you're just playing and then releasing it, not losing the shape, still in contact with the string, but completely losing the pressure. So you, you would get a, a muted sound if you were strumming and to repeat that process, you know, push into the chord shape for five, 10 seconds, release, push in, release. Cause as you do that, you've got the smallest, smaller move, smallest movement of those fingers pushing into the chord, so, you know, you know, pushing down on the notes of the chord at the same time, not this, this sort of business. So an E minor chord is probably going to be one that a lot of people will naturally be able to do that with because it's pretty simple typically. But if you're on a C chord, like we're talking about, or G or whatever, you know, they're, they're across three frets, they're more fingers. So, you know, this helps also with getting the fingers to work together. And, and the thing is, there's no sort of single method necessarily i think you know you see that the the goal is smooth chord changes and you've got different approaches that work towards that goal so it's important to you know i wouldn't say just do this one or just do you know anything we've covered here i would i mean work with it with a number of them to get that you know to get those Correct. chord changes nice and smooth um what about bar chords because we all know um you know, open chords, okay, they're challenging at first, but, you know, it's not often you get too many students um, who just cruise through bar chords, right? We hear all the same things. Sure. Oh, man, these chords are so hard. They sound like crap. And, and you know, I can still remember, you know, it's three decades now over, but I can remember playing bar chords and having a hard time playing them. And I probably went mm -hmm. totally the wrong way about doing it. But like you said before, if you just do something enough, you'll get there. But we don't want to take, you know, years to play smooth 
it's only barcodes. And again, it's not just, well, just keep practicing them. Um, you know, there's methods and strategies. So what are some of the ways you teach barcodes? Yeah, I, uh, I, I use the same approach you did 30 some years ago and, uh, <laughs> and it was painful and I could not go through a whole song if you use a lot of bar chords without, I, I did not have a lot of endurance and I actually ended up with a lot of pain. So uh, I had to relearn all that. So um, now what I do is I take, now again, we're, I'm, I'm looking at this from a, a, someone who's just a total beginner that's just starting to get the hang of these basic chords and is just starting to get the, 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 the gist of that. I would not introduce someone to bar chords until they've at least gotten a, a good foundation built with open chords, basic chords first, and they get the hang, they can synchronize the hands, they can, you know, they can do several rhythms, things like that. So yeah. once I get that foundation built, um, I know that they've got a little more um, capacity in, in their head to be able to kind of take on more, more challenges because bar chords are technically just brand new. They're totally new. They're like you're starting all over again. <laughs> you're going to feel like a total beginner. Um, and um, I approach them very slowly uh, because I learned just like you. And as you just said, the hard way. Um, and uh, if you go through and learn them the hard way, uh, you will eventually either have to spend a huge amount of time um, to overcome that um, and possibly injure yourself, which I did, um, or you could learn the right way the first time. So what I do is I start by tackling a single bar chord shape, um, single idea, because if you look at bar chords in general, they're mostly, there's only really two main shapes. Um, and, uh, I don't bother with the second, you know, a very difficult one until they actually master the first kind of shape, which would be the E, the E shape. Um, and so what I do is I get people to, first of all, um, learn to do, I, I start with F sharp minor. It's a fairly popular, um, bar chord, um, that you can use. And what I do is I get people to start with an E chord. Um, and instead of using fingers one, two, and three to do an E chord, right? Um, I get them to use fingers two, three, and four to do the E chord. And what that does is it allows them to, um, to mimic a bar chord. Yep. Yeah, those three things, exactly. So then I get them to move two frets up. That's it. That's all you do. You just slide it up. Notice you did not have to move anything, did not mm. have to lift anything. Uh, actually, I start with F sharp, not F sharp minor. Um, once I get them to do this, then we lift the finger. But the, the point is, that's it. And what I want you to do is, you can actually strum these if you want. Um, they, it doesn't sound horrible. It doesn't sound bad. It's mm -hmm. actually not too too bad. So, yes, nice. um, and just the, the first thing is to just get comfortable with that. And if I can get people to get comfortable with that, um, then what I do is I get them to do the move over. And in this case, I get them to just lay their finger, their bar finger down. That's it. Just lay your bar finger down. And at this point, I would tell them not to use any pressure whatsoever. Zero. None. And I mean none. I mean just touch the strings. And the reason for that is I've learned through my own bad experiences and through um, you know other people who come to me who learned the wrong way, that if you reinforce the wrong position, that sticks that sticks for life and all your bar chords are going to be affected because it's pretty much the same shape. So if you can get it right the first time right now, when you first learn it, then it's going to be the same effect, but for good. So I get people to just get comfortable putting the bar down, not trying to strum it, nothing like that. Um, and just find a, a place where it starts to become comfortable. And then I get them to go back to the E and I get them to come back and put the finger down. And what happens is in no time, people start feeling comfortable. Once they feel comfortable, it doesn't have to be perfect. They just, it just doesn't feel awkward anymore and starting to feel comfortable. What I get them to do is, and you already mentioned that in you know, a couple of minutes ago, I get them to do push-ups. And once they feel comfortable, so they move over, they're at that cord location. It feels good. They're comfortable. I get them to push down with all the fingers, including the bar finger, not hard, just, just push down enough to put pressure down on the strings, hold it for a second and let go. And you can do five of those, 10 of those. 
The main point here is that's going to reinforce that shape, that real comfortable, nice, relaxed bar chord. And if it's not relaxed, you're doing it wrong. That's that's the goal here, because if, if that, and that was my problem, and I'm sure that's how you felt when you first learned them. You're just muscling the, yeah. you know, the thing to death. And uh, it, it, I could never make it sound good for more than maybe the first couple of bar chords. And then after that, it fell apart because the strings were sinking into my skin. Right, because I was pushing too hard, and the harder you push, the more it sinks in. So it's just going to make it worse. You'd be amazed how a light touch, even though it's not super clear, it's actually sounds quite nice compared to muscling it. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I approach it, and then uh, and then once I get them to do that, I do move to F sharp minor, where you would lift the the ring finger, because most yeah. most of the songs that that people like F sharp minor is a very popular. <laughs> um you know uh bar chord it's all the songs that you put a capo on two and have an e minor that's the that's the bar chord right so g yep. d e minor c and there you go so those type of songs in in the key of a typically or or whatever um they usually work really well so um that's what i get them to do and then once they can do that i get them to strum and then we add other chords and so I think I'd go from, I'd approach it from an A to an F sharp minor, maybe a D to an F sharp minor, that kind of thing. And the key is every time you add a new chord change, you have to land it and be comfortable. You have to remember how comfortable it is. And that's why we keep going back to that E shape because that shows us and tells us what it feels like and how it should feel like when we put the bar down. Okay. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but uh, that's how I approach it. And I've had great success with it. Yeah, that's awesome. Where were you when I was trying to do this? <laughs> um, oh, look, where was I when I was trying to do this? Yeah. I know. <laughs> and I think um, it's it's good because I mean, apart from all the the benefits of yeah, you know, and and breaking it down like that is great. It also um, helps you understand where the bar chord comes from. It's an open chord moved up, you know, and it will help you understand the concept of a capo when you get into capo. Perhaps you've already done that by that point, but I remember. Right you know I, I i remember learning bar chords and not gluing on that hey it's an e chord shape moved up or an e minor moved up or an a or the a and this helps you and you go ah now i'm never going to forget which is which because i just relate it yeah. to the you know and that's the thing with chords chords should fit into the bigger picture as you learn more and more chords and ways of playing chords on the guitar they can't all just be isolated things they're going to click into place so, okay this one's a fragment of that chord or this one is you know relates to yeah you know, whatever it might be um i think with, with bar chords typically yeah if you just sort of jump into it from the start and just try and form the shapes i mean if you if you haven't really played guitar before it's quite new to you um you know we're used to picking up you know a bat or, or a broomstick or whatever it might be. And so we're gripping on for dear life as we grab the, the fretboard. And of course, you know, what happens is you end up pushing as hard with your thumb in the back of the neck as you are with your fingers in the front. And as a result, you're just squeezing the neck and you feel all this tension up the arm, which shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, so I often get students to form a bar chord this would be when, you know, this wouldn't be day one of bar chords, but when we're working with bar chords to get them to kind of uh, um, get the um, tension, if you like, or the pressure distribution, if you like, between the thumb and the fingers uh, on the uh, correct, I would get them to form that bar chord with no thumb on the back of the neck. So it's a hundred zero, basically. The yeah. thumb doing nothing, the hands are doing everything. And it doesn't, I mean, if you can sound it, great, but it doesn't matter if you can sound it or not. And when I'm sounding that there, I'm pushing quite hard because my thumb's not on the back of the neck. But I can come then and add my thumb and just take a little bit of the workload away from the fingers and support the fingers, the thumbs on the back to support the fingers at the front. And it just helps me, rather than just go bang, 50-50, both pushing as hard, it's 100-0, and then I can maybe get it to around that 80, 20. You know, that thumb is not really pushing into the back of the neck. It's it's slightly pushing in, but it's really just weighted down, and it's the friction of the thumb to the fretboard that stops it dropping away. I mean, it should be that if I come up and just hit your arm, that should just totally drop like a dead weight because the only thing keeping it there is the thumb. You're not pushing in 
you know, if I keep my arm all tense, it's going to stay right here. It should be, once that's lost, it should just be a, a dead weight your arm. So it's a way to sort of focus and individualize or isolate the the issue of the, you know, the pressure. And I think around, you know, 80, 20, 90, 10, whatever it might be, but certainly not squeezing. As soon as you squeeze, tension and, you know, all sorts of issues there. So, um, but yeah, I think your approach is great with uh with the bar chords and um you know they're still going to be challenging but that's that's guitar, you know it's going to be challenging but we can make it a lot easier or we can make it really really difficult and frustrating so um let me say uh, something real quick about what you just showed there with your thumb that learning to put the thumb inside the bar finger not behind it key yeah, yeah. when i learned that made all the difference because it automatically shifts your finger position forward it automatically puts weight on it. But uh, the secret to bar chords, people need to understand the secret to bar chords is not power, it's accuracy. Yes. Yeah. Period. And relaxed and accurate. And the subtle, yeah, just subtle little movements make a difference. Just the slightest thing. Maybe it's just getting that index finger a little bit more up against the fret. It looks like I'm on top of the fret there, but I'm right behind it, which is the sweet spot. If I'm over here, I'm going to have a harder time right. sending those notes. I'm not. I didn't lessen the pressure there. I just moved the position of the finger and I right. mean, prep, but it's not sounding any good. And yeah, maybe it's just a slight up or down movement. Like you said, realizing where the thumb needs to be in relation to the fingers on the back of the fret, but all these things make the difference. And then it's just regularly working with bar chords where you will develop the callus down the side of the index finger, right, uh, which that's then the next secret. All of a sudden, Wow, it's easier. I don't have to push as hard. It doesn't feel like I have to push as hard. I can just, you know, it's easier to to do. So, um, and then, you know, I've got electric guitar students who, man, I can't play bar chords on an acoustic guitar. It's so hard. And it's like, well, if you've tried it for five minutes and then gone back to your electric, yeah, it's going to be difficult. If you want to get good on the acoustic guitar with bar chords, just play a lot of acoustic guitar. You know, just do yeah. it regularly. Um, it's really as simple as that. There's nothing different on the acoustic guitar versus electric in terms of strategies for chords, period, really. Um, it's just get used to the tension of the strings and action and all that sort of stuff of the acoustic guitar versus electric. Um, we have a, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, one question here from Frank. Thanks, Frank, for the question. If a person doesn't have a good doesn't have good timing, how can they improve it? So, timing obviously is huge. Period with music, and often, in my experience, that's an issue that is probably almost the most common issue people have. A lot realize it, some don't, but you can see that's the issue. So, what are some uh, uh, good ways to improve timing? How to deal with timing specifically for students? It depends on it depends on the, on the individual and what they're trying to do, obviously, because there's there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, different timing aspects. Um, if we're talking about rhythm, uh, strumming on an acoustic guitar or even an electric guitar, um, then there's there's different things I do. Um, one thing I like to do is um, I don't when it when a lot of people say use a metronome that that's okay once someone has a really good basic knowledge and 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 a good good foundation where they can kind of do more one thing at once but for total beginners that's not going to work really well that's actually going to create more problems so what i do is i get um i actually get people to um use uh, backing tracks of a strum pattern let's say and um just play along with it that helps a lot or in class we do, we do a lot of that. We play with other people. So playing with other people is actually uh, one way you can do it. Someone who's better than you that can keep good time. But uh, because most people can't do that, that's what I do. I create back and tracks. You could create it yourself, um, you know, using uh, music software or whatever you could, um, whatever. And that's that's one way that I found that's the easiest because it's, it's kind of on the same dimension. Um, and it's going to be slow enough that people can kind of hear it. Um, but once you can kind of, get past that then the metronome is definitely a good way to do that to, to work on your timing um because then you can start listening for the click and you know you can just make sure that your strums are on the click your down strums are all in the click and when you change chords it's on the click and that's uh that's a really good way to do it and it's a good way to also increase your your speed and keep that timing and you know all that good stuff with you you may have some other things to add there simon yeah 
Definitely. That, that's that's great. I mean, timing is, is an issue. Um, I think, yeah, I think the metronome, metronome's great. If you just try and dive in playing with a metronome, yeah, not not a not a thing you want to be doing if, <laughs> from day one, right? I think with the metronome, just metronome tapping to the metronome, definitely. Where That's you great too, yes. Have the guitar or anything like that. You can just have a metronome clicking and you can tap at different tempos, you know, yep. music typically, uh, I guess the majority of musical would be somewhere between 60 beats per minute and 150 beats per minute. Of course, you might get something a bit slower. You'll certainly get faster, but a lot of that falls in that range. And, you know, most metronomes, I mean, you can just get the app on your phone now, right? So um, you can divide yeah. the beat. You can listen to quavers in a 4-4 time, triplets, you know, any division of the beat, semi-quavers, 16th notes. Um, so I think that's good. And any time you're listening to music, uh, you know, I assume you, you're going to be listening to music a lot. Um, you know, just tap along, just find the pulse. And because it doesn't matter if it's a single acoustic guitar strumming or a whole orchestra playing, there's a pulse that you want to focus exactly. on. And, you know, I've worked with singers before, particularly. And if they don't hear, like I might do acoustic stuff with a singer and, they you know they we, we hear the song as it is the original version when we play i often find singers can have a problem knowing when to come in because they're listening for cues that are in the original version which tells me they're yeah. not focused on the source which is just this so it doesn't matter if it's just a single guitar you know where the and of three is to come in with that, oh, to come in with that vocal phrase that was not exactly <laughs> um so you know that that's yeah, you've got to folk, don't get distracted with all the things that are happening when you're listening to a song, like the drums are doing this and the vocals doing that and there's a guitar part and all this stuff. That's all happening. You've got to be aware of that. But when you're working on the timing and you can just listen to the song, just find the pulse and just move, you know, to... Yeah, and the, the pulse is usually the bass. Yes. Usually the bass is the pulse in 90%, maybe more. And uh, that's where I would get people to listen because most people listen to vocals. They, they listen to the vocals and that's the worst place to listen if you want to get good timing and rhythm uh, when you're first starting out especially and to add to your tapping example once you can do the tapping just strum your guitar just transfer to just strumming and trying to do just and don't worry about chords don't worry about that just try to strum along that's another thing i get my students to do too yeah absolutely yeah just mute the strings here's the song yeah. and just yeah that's it because as soon just find as the beat, doing, find the groove. Yeah. And as soon as you're doing that, whether you realize it or not, your up strums are there too for an eight note type strumming pattern because you got to go back, oh, right. come back down, right? And this should be constant as well. So this is all going to help with your timing. So get a song and just find the pulse, find the beat, like you're clapping along. And yeah, exactly. I do that as well. Um, and now getting the, the, the timing and once you got really good timing, then you can play around with it. I mean, if you put a metronome to a song pre-2000, it's probably going to, that song is going to fluctuate. Um, it's not going to be bang on 90 beats per minute or whatever it is. It's going to move a little bit. Not it's probably not going to be uh, detectable by just listening, but uh, it, that's feel, you know, um, and moving around the beat and playing ahead or behind the beat. You hear about that at times and, and, everyone's got their natural way of sort of feeling time so once you develop good mechanics with time then you can start to be a little bit more creative with it and a lot of that i think comes naturally by playing a lot and playing songs and feel yeah, and things like that, which is different to timing feel is you, you gotta have good timing but feel is something else uh, again um so uh let's see here so there's a, a couple of other questions i think we will address here so they're both kind of along the same way uh uh same in the same vein so we've got frank again how to change up chord voicings to keep it interesting and there's another question here that's similar so we could maybe address both uh what's the best way to learn chords further up the guitar neck as opposed to just playing them all in the the open position so do you have uh i mean i know a lot of your students are you know you, you get them starting from scratch so do you get it what, what would be your approach after bar chords? Do you have a particular direction you take students with chords once they've got open and bar chords down? Um, so 
what I do after that will be would be something like um, showing people how to, um, let's say, take a C chord and move it all the way up the neck. So what they would have to do is they would have to get a, a they would have to figure this out themselves. They get a, a diagram, a chord chart or a, a fretboard chart, right? And yep. they would um, they would take a chord like a C chord, C E G. And then I would assign them strings and say, I want you to find all the C's that use these three strings. So let's say string six, uh, six, four, and three, or something like that, and find all the CEGs. Um, they would have to learn how to mute that fifth string. And then they find all the different shapes that make up a C, and you can go up the, up the neck. Then they learn how to play back and forth between them. And then they learn to uh, do that with other chords. You could, you could transpose those into existing songs obviously there's got a big jump by then they're pretty good so they can make the jumps um but then obviously it's learning other uh other voicings for other chords so you can kind of have them in the same kind of general area of the fretboard but yeah that's that's kind of how uh, i've approached it yeah. um i'm sure you've got lots to say about that though sure so you yeah triads is basically what you're getting them that's to where do i there. start yeah yeah and i think it's I mean, hard to add more but that's where i start yeah yeah and i think in a perfect world I would start students on triads <laughs> because it's it, it lays the foundation to actually understand chords if you just play open chords and bar chords i mean these are great of course and you're going to do that a lot as a guitar player and they give you a lot they give you access to songs and i think that's important i mean you know you want to be in and playing right so it, you know in a perfect world in my own sort of way i'd like let's do triads because we can then really understand chords and then you know it's, it's kind of like a bit of a, a snapshot of chords here. It, you can connect the, the bar chord to the open chords, like we are talking before, but there's a lot of blind spots on the fretboard, if uh, a lot of real estate unexplored, if you like, if you're just going to do bar chords and and uh, open chords. Because, of course, if we're playing a C, we can play a C here. We can play a bar chord there and we can play a C here. But what about everything in between and so forth? So Correct. triads, definitely. And triads, if people are wondering what triads are, it's just a three note chord. I mean, all major chords and minor chords have three notes, but when we're talking triads, we're just saying one note of each. I mean, if I play a C chord here, I've got, what have I got? Two Cs, two Es, and a, and a G there. So, you know, we've got some um, double ups with the notes. If I'm playing a C triad, I'm only, I'm only gonna play one of each of those notes. So, and right. it could be in any order here. So. And triads work in string sets. So we have like three, two, one, four, three, two, as you were saying, I think uh, five, four, three, or six, five, four. So, you know, you can learn your triad shape in all these positions and have a whole lot more available to you um, on the fretboard. You can play C in many, three positions per string set. For, so there's 12 more Cs that you could play just off of you know a couple of simple shots that's just in the first 12 frets yeah exactly um <laughs> and if you look at a lot of the the triad shapes if you've already got bar chords and open chords down and this is probably good a good thing to advocate doing the bar chords and open chords first um you can relate these shapes a lot of these shapes to those bar chords and open chords so yeah you know, the, the c triad here is the little fragment of the larger bar chord shape and then there's that triad in there and there's that triad in there so you've got these little triad shapes all within the larger c so that's that's what you want to do with chords in general is be able to connect them all together they've got to be connected otherwise you're not going to be able to find them when you want to use them in your playing and then there's some other triads that relate to the root five bar chord there's triads that might relate to you know you might picture of um as part of open chords so triads are good extensions are good so you might do that in an open chord position where you open position where you add extensions to your chords but you know for me a thing that really opened up the world of chords for me was when i studied jazz in the late 90s and uh that totally changed things for me um up until that point in time i've been playing about eight years and um you know i'd, I'd play other chords but pretty much because they were in a song I was playing. You know, I might play this chord, so I'm playing some Hendrix, but 
I don't know what the hell that chord is. They call it the Hendrix chord, so that's what I'll call it. You know, I had no understanding that it was an E7 sharp nine and that I could flat that nine or I could put a flat in the, you know, jazz might not be your thing, but it will open you up to harmony on the instrument and you will use it. I mean, these jazz chords are in Pink Floyd songs and Led Zeppelin songs. Led Zeppelin songs mm -hmm. will have diminished chords and major seven chords, as will, um, you know, uh, just look at a Bowie song. Um, it's it, some of his stuff is almost jazz like, you know, augmented chords and all these things. It's, it's Beatles tunes. Um, Elliot Smith, if you know of Elliot Smith, is it was brilliant chord progressions he would write. Um, so you study players like that, and uh, you know, it's some there's nothing like a great chord progression, nice voice leading and so forth. So these are, so certainly studying other players, other styles that you might not consider. I certainly didn't consider jazz. Um, I love it, but it's sort of beside the point. You don't have to. It's just going to teach you a lot about chord voicings. Um, and uh, a lot of them can relate very much to um, your bar chords. You might, for example, have an A major bar chord. So you can off of the same root, play an A major seven. You could play the A minor bar chord off of the same root. You could play an A minor seven, or you could play an A seven. So these are all stemming from the same root. So they're as easy to find as the bar chord. You've just you know, got to learn those shapes that uh, extend from those chords and then you've got the root five. So it's, it's huge. I mean, you know, you can go a number of different directions, but I think the triads is is a great place to start because it starts to fill in your the, the knowledge gaps that you find you get when trying to understand how chords work. And, um, and then from there, you can build and understand how you add notes to create extensions. And then you can start to build chords yourself on the fretboard. You don't necessarily have to always have to go and learn shapes. You can go, ah, oh, if I add this, it'll become that and so forth. So it's a harmonizing instrument. And, you know, if you're just going to do open chords and bar chords, you're missing out big time on what the instrument can do. Depends on what you want to do. If you just want to play a few songs, well, that's fine. Open chords, bar chords will do a lot for you. But, uh, you know, there's there's a lot more beyond, beyond that that I highly recommend checking out. Um, okay. So... Um, a couple other things we'll just talk about here briefly, perhaps, Mo. Um, core, you know, chord picking and, and oh, one more thing, actually. Sorry, there's one thing I was going to say about the chords. And I did just do a video on my YouTube channel, I think it was last week, and that is taking chords like open chords and just moving them up the fretboard without barring some places it won't sound great. Other places, it'll sound great. So you can just take open chords and move them up the fretboard. You can sort of use your ear and, and see where they sound okay. Uh, you can grab this E chord. You know, there's a lot of places where you can move the chord and keep the drone of the open string yet the notes, the fretted notes of the chord change, and then you get all kind of cool extensions and so forth to the chord. You don't have to know what they are. You're just playing around with, with the concept. So that's a good way. Often you see a D chord, C to D, might be played C, and the C moved up and you get this open G in there which suspends the chord. So um, there's things like that. And look out for those sorts of things. John Mayer, he's a good player to look at in terms of harmony and, and these types of things but that's some that's like a little uh yeah that's something that you can do immediately because you already know the shapes you just got to move them up to, to different areas but what about things like uh chordal picking we're talking about strumming and the importance of strumming and so forth what about picking the notes out of the chord which we hear often in in tunes as well do you have particular uh strategies right. developing that yeah so uh when it comes to just picking and what we call arpeggiating uh, chords. Um, yeah, I now again, if you're approaching it from a total beginner's total beginner from scratch, I would I would not start arpeggiating. <laughs> um, what I do is I start very, uh, very carefully, I would start uh, by getting people to just do simple riffs, simple melodies, 
uh, you know, start on a single string and we start building the technique, you know, of, of how to pick, which works very similar, alternate, alternate picking for the most part, just like you would strum, you know, you get this constant motion kind of thing. Uh, it's a little different with picking. Obviously, you're not going to keep doing this. Uh, but for the most part, when you are picking, and I try to, to, to pick things that, that, that work well first, and then, of course, coordinating the two. Um, and so I start with single string, then move to, you know, other strings, you know, not, not, so some people can do the low and high E strings really easily, but then they have a real hard time with the middle strings. So you move those things around uh, and then, you know, add more strings um, and, you know, try to stick to the, the one area of the fretboard at first for me uh, anyway, so that we're focusing on one thing at a time. But we do move around after they get comfortable with that. And then once they can kind of do that um, and they already have a, a good base a good foundation built when it comes to rhythm in general um because if they can't do the rhythm with strumming and changing chords it's going to be very very difficult um and even if they do have the picking um the picking skills it's going to be very difficult for them to do the arpeggiating and do it in time and do it with a with a proper uh rhythm so i i, I make sure they have a really good foundation laid first and so beginner would work on all these things in parallel. And so once they've developed all those skills, and it doesn't have to be like perfect, uh, then we start going into arpeggiating chords. And then we just start with simple uh, patterns, just, you know, where the, for the most part, the pick kind of follows, you know, simple trajectories. We don't do, you know, don't add too many bass notes or anything like that. Um, and, um, and the most important thing is um, people really struggle uh, getting different rhythms while they're they're arpeggiating it, it's very difficult it, they can do it while strumming but it's very difficult for them to to kind of get the idea so um one way i i because rhythms are, are theme here um i will say that one way that i get them to kind of understand and feel the rhythm so that they can arpeggiate it properly or pick it properly is by getting them to strum it beforehand um, yeah, yeah. And even with the, the 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 chords, right? Getting them to say, "Hey, this is how this this rhythm works," or getting them to understand how it works, you know, in a strumming context. And then once they they get that, then it's a lot easier for them to translate that to their picking hand. Um, and that 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 is actually a really uh, that's a place that a lot of people struggle uh, trying to get rhythms with their picking hand, um, you know, to uh, to make sure that the timing's right and all that stuff. So yeah, so that's kind of my approach in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I think, um, yeah, I mean, chordal picking, I call it chordal picking or arpeggiating the chords or picking the chords or whatever it is, is great. People love it because it sounds just that little bit more sophisticated, right? When you pick oh, awesome. the chords. And I mean, it's, it's yeah, I think timing again, um, similar to sort of when strumming, it's it's been able to technically do what's required, but also keep everything flowing. Um, but it's a great skill to have because then you can ad lib with it um there's a lot of songs i would play that have picking in it that Correct. i mean if, if i'm doing a gig and it's a hotel california okay fine i don't know the picking arrangement but i can hear the song in my head i've played it enough times that i can ad lib the picking for that and fool people and if i don't it doesn't matter i'm just ad libbing the picking but having that skill means you don't have to go and remember all these picking arrangements for certain songs of course you can do that and some are probably more specific than others but um in terms of developing the skill again, I think, yeah, getting a bit of a, a radar, if you like, for where the strings are. So you don't have to look. If you're looking, then, you know, you're never, never going to. Yeah, that's it. important. Yeah, exactly. Really, right. Um, so, and, and it doesn't matter how many times you do it. If you don't practice without looking, you're not going to get good at doing it without looking really. Um, so, you know, learn a pattern, sure. Whatever it might be, something like this. Now, obviously not from day one. Like you said, you, you can build it up much slower. <laughs> but when you get to the point where you are picking a pattern of sorts, I would get students to do that and look, and then without stopping the picking, look away. So you've got it going. So you've looked, you've got it going, and then you look away as you continue. And even if you hit a wrong string, this is the thing with this approach. It's very forgiving because if you're on a G chord, there is no wrong string, really. It's just another note in the chord and a lot of those chords. So it's once you've got the flow going, 
it's actually more forgiving than you're strumming probably well strumming perhaps too but it's hard to hit a wrong note um a lot of the time when i caught a pick i might hit a string i don't intend to but it's fine the only mistake i might make i don't but the mistake you could make is stopping thinking you've made a mistake and that's the mistake in itself there goes the flow um the other issue i find people have is kind of similar to strumming is chord changes with picking um you know picking a pattern and then continuing on a different chord and maintaining the the, the timing and so i find often it can help if we're picking on a g chord and we're going to go to c to go to c and just pick the first note and stop there so you're picking the full bar on one chord and just the root note of the next chord form the chord don't just put the finger there and play the c note form the chord pick c so you've you know there was a gap there between the two chords you've you've crossed it so you you've been able to connect to the next chord without having to think also about oh, what's my pat what's my pattern there where am i picking on this c chord so you can just do i with... actually do the same thing with people uh, with strumming sometimes when yeah. it's complex strum pattern i yeah. just get them to hit the next one that's it. exactly that's the next same one. concept because you know you're always going to have these gaps when you're breaking things up and isolating things so you you know you work with, with those things but then they create a a a, a, a gap that you've got to join so yeah, yeah just that just step over into that next part without doing all the picking and once you've got that the picking becomes much easier and when you've got it going it'll just click in you'll go wow yeah I exactly can pick here and it sounds all right a, a general i don't know if we call it a rule but generally speaking it's best to pick from the root note of the chord so if you're on an e minor pick the e note if you're on c pick the c first and then pick your pattern um doesn't have to be like that. It isn't always like that, but most times that's going to sound best. And the other thing is with picking itself, generally speaking, um, it will come down to the specific context, but I find picking in the direction of the next string. So you're naturally following through to where you need to be next. So if I'm picking a pattern on a C chord where I'm picking strings five, four, three, and then one, two, three, I'm going to pick down on those lower three because that's the direction I'm going. When I get to the top string, I'm going to pick up because I'm heading back in this direction. If I pick down on that top string, now I've got an extra movement I'm going to make to get to where I need to pluck that second string and so forth. So whatever the pattern is, it's, it's, it's going to flow better if you follow through to where you need to be next with your direction. So it's not necessarily going to be alternating your pick as you pick up and down the court down up down up down it's typically not going to be the best way to do it that's pretty inefficient and will create a lot more work um for the same sound essentially so yeah and then there's picking and strumming i mean there's yeah, there's so many things we could talk about here but but these are really important things really important things um it, it's funny you can you can tell uh even when when someone's got solid rhythm guitar skills, and I'm talking about the basics, not necessarily a whole lot of chord vocab and and this sort of stuff, or or anything that technically you know high in in level, you can tell a great player even if they're just doing basic stuff. You know the strumming sounds good. There's dynamics to their playing. There's a the timing is really good. You know you can really. It's not that someone else who does it quite well doesn't sound good, but if you, yeah, developing great skills in this area is going to go a long, long way. Um, I can hear someone strumming on a guitar and I, okay, I can't tell everything about their playing just by hearing them strum, but I can, I can, it's feel again, you know, you can really recognize great feel in a very short amount of time. Um, you know, great players make the basics sound really, really good because they're, they're competent in, in them and they realize the importance of things like good timing and feel. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so definitely things to to focus on um, when you're working with your guitar playing as opposed to just always wanting to do the more advanced things or wanting to just solo, um, all this sort of stuff. You know, be a great rhythm player um, is going to go a long way to, um, you know, develop your skills in the soloing arena as well. So, Mo, I believe you do have something here um, that's available on your website, Guitar Lessons 
for beginnersonline.net that uh, you want to have a quick uh, chat about? Yeah, sure. So this is uh, this is a great um, resource. Uh, it's a uh, it's a course that goes through the the, the basics and um, we cover the picking and all the things that we just talked about how to properly pick, how to build up that proper technique. Um, we cover all that. We go through some of the most important chords and some and some of the rhythm rhythms in there as well. Um, and so it's perfect for for total beginners who just want to get on the you know get started on the right foot. Uh, but it's also pretty good for uh, for people who already have some skills and uh, maybe aren't sure if their their technique is is, is proper. So it, it can take some of those skills and iron them out and, and get rid of the, the bad habits or even fill in gaps that you may have that you didn't even know you had. So it's a really good course uh, in general that will help anybody from beginner to uh, intermediate. Excellent. Well, I have something here too that you may be interested in. And it's kind of, I guess we could say hand in hand with what you were just talking about there. This is an, an ebook audio that uh, goes, once you've got the basics down, this goes into some more advanced concepts, not super, super advanced, but basically the whole book's based on a single chord progression, a common chord progression. I think it's a one, five, six, four. It's a progression you'll hear all the time in, in uh, songs. And there's, I think, maybe five ways that you could address playing that chord progression. Very different ways. I think one way is using a capo and ways that you can use a capo in very simple ways to make something sound completely different. Um, we look at some uh, picking hand options, some chordal picking. There's work with triads in this book. So if you're interested in the triads and wanting to understand a little bit more about those, I use the chord progression or use triads to play the chord progression. Some finger picking in there, some harmonics. So different rhythm guitar um, techniques that are kind of come after all the, the foundational stuff um, is what I cover in this book. And it's via one chord progression because I want you to see how you can um, dress up, if you like, this, a single basic common chord progression and make it sound quite different, whether it's picking hand techniques, fretting hand techniques, or, or whatever it might be. So that is available uh, on the link that you see there. I'm just putting these into the chat so you guys can check that out. Um, and that, yeah, that that's a free resource, that one. You just opt in for it and it will be emailed out to you and you can check that out. So I will whack that in the chat as well so the links are in the chat there if you guys want to check those things out so mo thank you so much for your time today always great to have a chat um, about these things i really appreciate your time and uh and knowledge and expertise and thank you everyone who has shown up here today and for the questions great to see you and um you know these acoustic guitar talks are fun to do and there will be more of them coming up so look out for those and of course you can catch the, the replays on my youtube channel as well if you weren't able to get here live today so thank you mo very much for that i really appreciate it my pleasure excellent so thank you guys enjoy your weekend ahead whatever time it is for you in your part of the world and we will see you on the next acoustic guitar talk take care